lead off the Lord, what do you think they had in mind? See, what my friend pointed out to me was, why do we think that they have come to minister under uh, unto a dead body? No, they came expecting the risen Lord to appear to them in the flesh, in this flesh, just as he had always been. Do you know what that means? That they absolutely trusted in the words of Jesus Christ. That's what that means. That means that they trusted in his words. They trusted with the simple heart. They trusted with the heart of our childlike understanding. They thought that he was going to be raised up to a life that was just like the life he had had in this flesh. But you see, the fact that, that they were a little off-key in terms of, of understanding what that life was about, that doesn't matter, does it? Because what they showed was a pure and absolute faith in Jesus Christ. They didn't go hide in the shadows. They didn't go somewhere where no one would find them. They followed the true faith they had in his word. And they came to that too, expecting that he would come to them. And that they would clean him up. And that they would help to put new breath upon him that he would go to the world. And that means that, that it was their deep faith that led them to be there. It was their true understanding. And yet, the one little little error was that when Jesus rose again, it was not to this life, but to new life. To the very new life that through his resurrection, he promises to all who follow him, to all who take up the cross, to all who go to Golgotha, to all who are willing to be dead to the things that this world thinks is so, uh, so, so important. For those who are willing, like Christ, to, to lay that flesh in the tomb in terms of turning away from what the world says is wonderful and turning toward what God says is true. They know that they shall live now as Jesus lived. They may suffer now as Jesus lived. But they will be raised up again by their Father God to the new life in which that suffering will be redeemed by joy in which that seeming death will be replaced by the life that never ends. See? But, but that, that understanding would then call us, don't you think, not to see things the way the world sees them. Because if, if we are true followers of Christ, if we are truly faithful as those women were, if we are to act as they did because of their faith, as apostles, if they are, we are to be whether as followers or as leaders, those who will shepherd souls to God, okay? then, then we have to be willing to see people as God sees them and to understand life as he understands. Now here I have a question for you. I want to walk us, if you don't mind, through a little history. This is a history, by the way, that some people want us to forget. And, and, and that... I think it would be a big mistake if we forget. I stand before you here today. Um, uh, some of you have probably noticed that I'm a black guy. <laughs> but you know, when you say that, that doesn't mean you know who I am. That's the old way of understanding. They call it racism. And if you look at somebody and you think you know them because of the color of their skin, and you come to conclusions about them yeah. because of the color of their skin, and you are going to stand for or against them because of the color of their skin, then you're a racist. That's right. okay? And some people try to pretend, no, it's only when you're negative. That's a lie. You understand this? Every bit of injustice that was ever done to anybody on the grounds of race in this country was done by somebody where somebody else was standing in the background thinking, but that's not right. That's wrong. God says you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't be lynching and you shouldn't be murdering and you shouldn't be enslaving. And they went ahead and did it anyway. And they were tempted to stand forward. They wanted to come forward and say, stop that. Don't brutalize that man. Don't rape that woman. Don't enslave that child. Just as they were about to move, somebody else said, You're a white man. How can you stand up for those people? Yeah. <laughs> you are betraying your race. You are betraying your people because you're white and you can't stand up for God's truth. All right. When a black man is involved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have we forgotten that that's how they did it? Yeah. I think we have. All right. I'm sorry. 
I think we've utterly forgotten it. Yeah. And by forgetting it, we have been betrayed into repeating the very evil that enslaved our ancestors. That's All right. right. Okay? Because right. I, I find myself in this position right now. All right. There are people in this society who do not believe that we are all created equal. Amen. They don't believe that we are all equal in the eyes of Almighty God. They don't believe that before he formed us in the womb, he knew us, he made us, that we were complete, we were whole in the mind of God. They don't believe that. But when God made us, and when he instilled in us that spark, that spirit of himself, of his presence, of his will, of his life, and we became a living soul, that living soul has just as much of the dignity, the worth, the power, the intention of God Almighty as every other living soul he makes. And that is the equality of God. That is the equality that corresponds with the right that he has determined to be right. Amen. Amen. Now, after God has done that, now, as I often tell people, according to the scripture, when God does that, when, when, when he fashions us in that way, is there anybody around to see it? No. No. See? Because he says, he says in, in the Psalms that he fashions us in the secret places. I have fastened you in the secret places of the world. So secret means nobody knows but him. He fashions our life in a place where there is only him, where there's only his will, only his mind, only his eyes, only his ability to make us what we are. And as I often tell people, he's like a writer who's, who's writing in secret. And in secret, he writes down everything about us. He writes down everything we're going to be. He writes down how our body is going to work and what our hair is going to look like and what color our skin is going to be and all these things that we get to see. And, and then he writes down how many hairs there will be on our head at every second of every day of our lives. He writes down in that book when we're going to be up and when we're going to be down and how the body's going to work. We'll be a fast runner. We'll be a slow runner. We'll be a great thinker. We'll be a less great thinker. We'll be somebody who has a good heart that makes people smile all the time. Or we'll be somebody who needs cheering up every other day. <laughs> the Lord has written down in that book, in the book of his knowledge of who we are, every last moment of our joy and every last moment of our grief. And, and the wonderful thing about it is that that's because he is present in every moment. He is present in the joy. He is present in the grief. He is present in the time of temptation. He is present when we think we are lost. He is present when we let ourselves be found. He's always with us. See? And he writes down every last thing that he can observe and he can see and he helps to make. He writes it all down in that book of our lives. As it were, and, and as he writes, that which he knows becomes reality. But that whole, that whole fact of creation, it, it takes place where we don't get to see it. He's like a writer who writes everything down in secret. He only publishes it in the womb. The, the womb is the, is the place of publication. Okay, you're finished now. You're finished now. I am going to share you with the world. And that's what happens in the world. He makes us in secret. And he makes us in every particular. He makes us to be everything that we are to be. And if somebody comes along and looks at that, at that little mass of cells in the womb or looks at that little tiny little person there with the little hands and feet, that is in the womb, or looks finally at that, at that infant child at eight or nine months all curled up, just waiting in the ready room, about to be born. They, they, are, they are just seeing, they are just seeing what looks to our eyes as this stage and that stage. If at some stage of that, they say, well, that one's not ready yet, we can kill that one. That one's not ready yet, we can kill that one. That one's not ready yet. We can kill that one. Do they have the right to do that? No. no. Of course, they can't have the right to do 